Who's there? Perry, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. Leonardo, he. You come most carefully upon your hour. It is now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. It is bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet, guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand home! Who's there? Friends to the strong! And liegemen to the game. Give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier. Who hath relieved you? Bernardo hath my place. Give you good night. Hola, Bernardo? Say what? Is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What? Has this thing appeared again tonight? I have seen nothing. Horatio says tis but our fantasy. <laughs> and will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, tush, twill not appear. Sit down a while, and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story, what we have two nights seen. Well, sit we down, and let us hear, Bernardo, speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illume that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one piece, break thee off. Look where it comes again. In the same figure, like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar, speak to it, Horatio. Looks it not like the king, mark it, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Question it, Horatio. What art thou that usurps this time of night? Together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of very Denmark did sometimes march. By heaven I charge thee. Speak. It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay, speak. Speak, I charge thee, speak. It is gone. And will not answer. How oh, now, Horatio? You tremble and look pale. Is not this something more than fantasy? What think you on it? Before my God, I might not disbelieve without the sensible and true avouch of my own eyes. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Such was the very armor he had on when he, the ambitious Norway, combated. So frowned he once when in an angry pile he smote the slitted Polax on the ice. It is strange. Thus twice before, and jump at this dead hour, with martial stalk hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work, I know not. But in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. In the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell, the grave stood tenantless, and the sheet of dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets. Soft, behold, lo, when it comes again. I'll cross it, though it blast me. Stay, illusion. If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily for knowing may avoid, speak of it. Stay and speak. Stop it, Marcellus. Shall I strike at it with my partisan? Do as it will not stand. It is here. It is here. It is gone. We do it wrong, being so majestical, to offer it the show of violence. For it is as the air and vulnerable, and our vain blows malicious mockery. It was about to speak when the cock crew, and then it started, like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. I have heard. The cock that is the trumpet to the morn doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat awake the god of day. And at his warning, whether in sea or fire, in earth or air, the extravagant and erring spirit Highs to his confine. It faded on the crowing of the cock. 
Some say that ever against that season comes wherein our Saviour's birth is celebrated. The bird of dawning singeth all night long. And then they say no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome. Then no planet strike. No fairy takes. No witch hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is the time. So have I heard and do in part believe it. But look. The morn in russet mantle clad walks on the dew of yon high eastern hill. Break we our watch up, and by my advice let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, this spirit dumb to us will speak to him. Though yet of Hamlet our dear brother's death the memory be green, and that it us be fitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe, yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress of this warlike state, have we as twere with a defeated joy with one auspicious and one dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. Nor have we here barred your better wisdoms which have freely gone with this affair, Lord, for all our thanks. Now follows that you know, young Thorntonbris, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death our state to be disjoint and out of frame, co it with a dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father with all bonds of law to our most valiant brother. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who, impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose to suppress his further gate herein. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltamand, our bearers of this greeting to old Norway. Farewell, and let your haste commend your duty. In that and all things will we show our duty. We doubt it nothing. Heartily farewell. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the dame and lose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking? The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? My dread lord, your leave and favor to return to France, from whence though willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation, yet now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France and bar them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by laboursome petition, and at last, upon his will, I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes, time be thine, and thy best graces spend it at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet and my son, a little more than kin, and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I am too much of the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy nighted colour off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowst tis common. All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Aye, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam? Nay, it is. I know not seems. It is not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage together with all forms, modes, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem for their actions that a man might play, but I have that within which passeth show. 
These but the trappings and the suits of woe. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father, that father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persever in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled, for what we know must be and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense. Why should we in our peevish opposition take it to heart? Fie, tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature. We pray you, throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son do I impart toward you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire. And we beseech you, bend you to remain here, in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee stay with us, go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, it is a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. In grace whereof, no jocund health that Denmark drinks today, but the great cannon to the clouds shall tell. And the kings rouse, the heavens shall brute again, re-speaking earthly thunder. Come, away. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Oh, that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fire, Pont, oh, fire. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, that it should come to this, but two months dead. Nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. So loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet within a month, let me not think on't. Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, even she, oh, God, a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married to my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. Oh, most wicked speed to boast with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Hail to your lordship. I'm glad to see you well. Horatio! For I do forget myself. The same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. But what made you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus? My good lord. I am very glad to see you. Good even, sir. But what in faith made you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good my lord. <laughs> I would not hear your enemy say so. Nor should you do mine ear that violence to make it truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are not truant. But what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll teach you to drink deep. Ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. 
I pray thee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father. Methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man. Take him for all in all, I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. So? Who, oh, my lord? The king. Your father. The king? My father! Season your admiration for a while with an attent here. Till I may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen this marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch in the dead vast and middle of the night, been thus encountered. A figure like your father, armed at point exactly, cap pay, appears before them and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Thrice he walked by the repressed and fierce surprised eyes within his truncheon's length, whilst they distilled almost to jelly with the act of fear, stand down and speak not to him. This to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I with them the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good, the apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. Where was this? My lord, upon the platform where we watched. Did you not speak to it? My lord, I did. But answer me did none. Yet once we thought it lifted up its head and did address itself to motion, like as it would speak. But even then the morning cock crew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away and vanished from our sight. It is very strange. As I do live, my honoured lord, tis true. And we do think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed. Indeed, sirs. But this troubles me. Hold you the watch tonight. We do, my lord. Arm, say you. Armed, my lord. From top to toe. My lord, from head to foot. Then saw him not his face? Oh, yes, my lord. He wore his beaver up. What looked he, frowningly? A countenance more than solid than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. Why would I have been there? It would have much amazed you. Very like, very like. Stayed it long? While one with moderate taste might tell a hundred. Longer? Not when I saw it. His beard was grizzled, no? It was as I have seen it in his life. A sable, silvered. I will watch tonight. Perchance it will walk again. I warrant it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall hap tonight, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Our duty to your honor. Your loves as mine to you. Farewell. My father's spirit in arms. All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come? Till then, sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. My necessaries are embarked. Farewell. And sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? For Hamlet and the trifling of his favor, Hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, forward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute, no more. No more, but so. Think it no more. Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor cautel doth besmirch the virtue of his will, but you must fear. His greatness weighed, his will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. 
He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and health of this whole state. Then weigh what loss your honor may sustain, if with too credent ear you list his songs or lose your heart, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Fear it, Ophelia. Fear it, my dear sister. And keep you in the rear of your affections, out of the shot and danger of desire. A chariest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But good, my brother, do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whilst like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Oh, fear me not. I stay too long. But here my father comes. A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second lead. Yet here, Laertes, a board, a board for shame. The wind sits in the shoulder of your sail, and you are stayed for. There. My blessing with thee. And these few precepts in thy memory look thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new-hatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, not gaudy, for the apparel oft proclaims the man. And they in France of the best rank and station are most select and generous chief in that Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell. My blessing season this in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. The time invites you. Go. Your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia. And remember well what I've said to you. Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Farewell. What is it, Ophelia, he hath said to you? So please you something touching the Lord Hamlet. Marry, well bethought. Tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, as so it is put on me, and that by way of caution, I must tell you you do not understand yourself so clearly as behooves my daughter and your honor. What is between you? Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Pooh! You speak like a green girl unsifted in such perilous circumstance. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Mary, I'll teach you. Think yourself a baby that you obtain these tenders for true pay which are not sterling. Tender yourself more dearly. Or, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, running it thus, you'll tender me a fool. My lord... He hath importuned me with love, in honorable fashion. I fashion you may call it, go to, go and to. And hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. I springes to catch woodcocks. I do know when the blood burns how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. These blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both, you must not take for fire. From this time... Be something scanter of your maiden presence? Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Lord Hamlet, 
Believe so much in him that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk than may be given you. In few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. Look to it. I charge you. Come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and an eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks of twelve. No, it is struck. Indeed. I heard it not. It then draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wont to walk. What does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake tonight and takes his rouse, keeps wassail in the swaggering upspring reels, and as he drains his draughts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? Aye, Mary Ist. To my mind, though I am native here, and to the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. This heavy-headed rebel east and west makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They clip us drunkards. Look, my lord! It comes. <sighs> Angels and ministers of grace, defenders, be thou a spirit of health, O goblin damned. Bring with the airs from heaven, or blasts from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. Oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hersed in death, have burst their seerments. Why the sepulchre, when we saw thee quietly and earned, hath oped his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again. What may this mean, that thou, dead course again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so horrid to shake our dispositions with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls? Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? It beckons you to go away with it, as if it's some impartment to desire to you alone. Look with what courteous action it waves you to a more removed ground. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then will I follow it. Do not, my lord. Why, what should be the fear? I do not set my life at a pin's fee. And for my soul, what can it do to that being a thing immortal as itself? It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What of a tempute of the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of a cliff that beetles all his face into the sea? And there assume some other horrible form which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness. It waves me still. Go on, I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. Be ruled, you shall not go. My fate cries out and makes each petty artery of this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called. And hand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I make a ghost of him that lets me. I say, away. Go on. I'll follow thee. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey him. Have after. To what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Hey, let's follow him. Whither wilt thou lead me? Speak. I'll go no further. Mark me. I will. My heart. Flames must render up myself. Alas, poor ghost. Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, 
Doom for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars start from their spheres, thy knotted and combined locks to part, and each particular hair to stand and end like quills upon the fretful porpentine. But this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. List, list, oh, list. If thou didst ever thy dear father love, Oh, God. Revenge is foul and most unnatural. Murder. Murder! Murder most foul, as in the best it is. But this most foul, strange and unnatural. Haste me to know it, that I, with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. I find thee apt. Duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in ease on Lethe Wharf, wouldst thou not stir in this? Now, Hamlet, here. Tis given out that sleeping in my orchard a serpent stung me, so the whole year of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused. But know, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle! Ay, that incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wit, with traitorous gifts, oh, wicked wit and gifts that had the power so to seduce, one to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Oh. But soft, methinks I sent the morning air. Brief let me be. Sleeping within mine orchard, my custom always of the afternoon, upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with juice of cursed heaven and in a vial, and in the porches of mine ears did pour the leprous distillment, whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man, that swift as quicksilver, it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body. Thus was I, sleeping by a brother's hand, of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched, cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannealed, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. Oh, horrible. Oh, horrible. Most horrible. If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But howsoever thou pursuest this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven, and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting her, fare thee well at once. The glowworm shows the matting to be near, and begins to pale his uneffectual fires. Adieu, adieu, Hamlet, remember. All you host of heaven, O oh earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? Hold, hold my heart, and you, my sins, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee, ay, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. Remember thee, yea, from the table of my memory I wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all precious past that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter, yes, by heaven. O oh, most pernicious woman. O oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. 
I take this. Meet it as I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I'm sure it may be so in Denmark. So, Uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is adieu, adieu. Remember me. I have sworn. My lord! My lord! The Hamlet! Heaven secure him! So be it. Hello, boy! Come, bird, come! How is my noble lord? What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord. Tell it. No, you will reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven. Not I, my lord. How say you then? Would heart of man once think it, but you be secret? Aye, by I heaven, my lord. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark. But he's an arrant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Why, right? You were the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You, as your business and desire shall point you, for every man has business and desire, such as it is. And for mine own poor part, look you, I will go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I'm sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. There's no offence, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is Horatio and much offence, too. Touching this vision here... <laughs> It is an honest ghost, that let me tell you. For your desire to know it is between us all mastered as you may. And now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars, and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is, my lord? We will. Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord, we will not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Not I, my lord, in faith. Upon my soul. But we have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed. Upon my sword, indeed. Aha. Sayst thou so? Art thou there, true penny? Come on, you hear this fellow in the cellarage consent to swear. Propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Swear. <laughs> Take it a big way, then we shift our ground. Come hither, gentlemen, and lay our hands again upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by my sword. Swear by his sword. <laughs> well said, old mole. Canst work in the earth so fast a worthy pioneer. Once more remove, good friends. Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, here, as before, never so help you mercy. How strange or odd soe'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on. That you at such time see me, never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this head shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrases. Well, well, we know, we could, and if we would, or there be, and if they might, or if we list to speak, or other such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me, this not to do. So grace and mercy it is most needs help you. Swear. Rest. Rest. Perturbed spirit. So, gentlemen... With all my love, I do commend me to you. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is may do to express his love and friending to you, God willing, shall not lack. Let us go in together. And still your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. Nay, come, let's go together. Give him this money and these notes, Rinaldo. I will, my lord. You shall do marvelous wisely, good Rinaldo, before you visit him to make inquire of his behavior. My lord, I did intend it. Marry, well said, very well said. Look you, sir. Inquire me first what danskers are in Paris, what company they keep, and finding they do know my son, take you as it were some distant knowledge of him, as thus. I know his father and his friends, and in part him. But you may say, not well. But if be he, I mean, he's very wild, 
addicted, so and so, and there put on him what forgeries you please. Marry, none so rank as may dishonor him, take heed of that. As gaming, my lord? Ah, uh, or drinking, fencing, swearing, quarreling. Drabbing, you may go so far. But my good lord. Wherefore should you do this? Marry, sir, here's my drift. Your party in converse, him you would sound. He closes with you in this consequence. Good sir, or so, or friend, or gentleman, according to the phrase or the addition of man and country. Very good, my lord. And then, sir, does he this? What was I about to say? By the mass, I was about to say something. Where did I leave? At closes in the consequence. That closes in the con. Aye, Mary. He closes with you thus. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday. Or t'other day, or then, or then, with such or such. And, as you say, there was a gaming. There, or took in his rouse, there falling out of tennis. Or, perchance, I saw him enter such a house of sale. Did he listen to a brothel or so forth? See you now. Your bait of falsehood takes this carp of truth. And so do we, of wisdom and of reach, with windlasses and with assays of bias. By indirections, find directions out. So by my former lecture and advice shall you, my son. You have me, have you not? My lord, I have. God be we. Fare ye well. Good, my lord. Observe his inclination in yourself. I shall, my lord. And let him ply his music. Well, my lord. Farewell. Now, oh, now, Ophelia, what's the matter? My lord, my lord, I have been so affrighted. With what in the name of God? My lord. As I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded and down jiver to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look so piteous and purport as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors, he comes before me. Mad for thy love? My lord, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand thus saw his brow. He falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it. Long stayed he so. At last a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus waving up and down. He raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets me go, and with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes, for out of doors he went without their helps, and to the last bended their light on me. Come, go with me. I will go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love. What? Have you given him any hard words of late? No, my good lord. But as you did command, I did repel his letters and denied his access to me. That hath made him mad. I'm sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle and meant to wreck thee, but beshrew my jealousy. By heaven, it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. Come, go we to the king. This must be known. Come. Welcome, dear Rosenkrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? What it should be, more than his father's death, that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both that being of so young days brought up with him, and since so neighbored to his youth and havior, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time, so by your companies to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that opened lies within our remedy. 
Good gentleman, he hath much talked of you. And sure I am, two men there are not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and goodwill as to expend your time with us a while for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might, by the sovereign power you have of us, put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty. But we both obey, and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz. And I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Uh, go, one of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye, amen. My lord, the ambassadors from Norway are joyfully returned. Thou still hast been the father of good news. Have I, my lord? I assure my good liege, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my God and to my gracious king. And I do think, or else this brain of mine hunts not the trail of policy so sure as it hath used to do, that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that. That do I long to hear. Give first admittance to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit to that great feast. Thyself do grace to them and bring them in. He tells me, my dear Gertrude, he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the main. His father's death and our or hasty marriage. Well, we shall sift him. Welcome, my good friends. Say, Voldemand, what's from our brother Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desires. Young Fortinbras receives rebuke from Norway, and in fine makes vow before his uncle never more to give the assay of arms against your majesty. But on old Norway, overcome with joy, gives him commission to employ those soldiers so levied as before against the Polak, with an entreaty herein further shown that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominion for this enterprise. It likes us well. And at our more considered time, we'll think upon an answer to this business. Meantime, we thank you both for your well-took labor. Go to your rest. At night, we'll feast together. Most welcome home. This business is well ended. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. <laughs> Mad, call I it for, to define true madness. What is it but to be nothing else but mad? But let that More go. More matter with less art. Madam, I swear I use no art at all. That he is mad, tis true. Tis true, tis pity, and pity tis, tis true. A foolish figure, but farewell it, for I will use no art. Mad, let us grant him then. And now remains that we find out the cause of this effect. Or rather say, the cause of this defect. For this effect defective comes by cause. <laughs> thus it remains, and the remainder thus perpend. I have a daughter, half while she is mine, who in her duty and obedience, Mark, hath given me this. Now gather and surmise. To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia. That's an ill phrase, a vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase, but you shall hear. Um, <laughs> thus in her excellent white book... Came this from Hamlet to her? Good madam, stay a while, I will be faithful. Mm -hmm. Ah, doubt thou the stars are fire. Doubt that the sun doth move. Doubt truth to be a liar. But never doubt I love. Oh, dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers. I have not art to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best. Oh, most best, believe it. Adieu, uh, thine evermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him, Hamlet. 
This in obedience hath my daughter shown me, and more above hath his solicitings, as they fell out by time, by means and place, all given to mine ear. But how hath she received his love? <laughs> what do you think of me? As of a man faithful and honorable. I would fain prove so. But what might you think? When I had seen this hot love on the wing, as I perceived it, I must tell you that before my daughter told me, what might you, or my dear majesty, your queen here, think, if I had played the desk or table book, or given my heart a winking, mute and dumb, or looked upon this love with idle sight? <laughs> what might you think? No, I went round to work, and my young mistress thus I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince, out of thy star, this must not be. And then I prescripts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens. This done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repulsed, a short tale to make, fell into a sadness, then into a fast, thence to a watch, thence into a weakness, thence to a lightness, and by this declension into the madness wherein now he raves. And all we mourn for. Do you think tis this? It may be very like. Hath there been such a time, I'd fain know that, that I have positively said tis so, when it proved otherwise? Not that I know. Take this from this, if this be otherwise. If circumstance lead me, I will find where truth is hid, though it were hid indeed within the center. How may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks for hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such a time, I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an arras, then mark the encounter. If he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for his state, but keep a farm and carters. We will try it. But look where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away. I, I do beseech you both. Away. I'll board him presently. Oh, give me leave. How does my good lord Hamlet? Well, got a mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent, Will. You are a fishmonger. Not I, my lord. Then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? I say to be honest as this world goes is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very true, my lord. For if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a god, kissing, carrion. Have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Friend, look to it. How say you by that? Still harping on my daughter, and yet he knew me not at first. He said I was a fishmonger. Oh, he's far gone, far gone. And truly in my youth, I suffered much extremity for love very near this. I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words. Huh? Words. Words. What is the matter, my lord? Between whom? I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Slander, sir. For the satirical rogue says here that old men have grey beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum tree gum, that they have a plentiful lack of wit together with most weak hands. All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honestly to have it thus set down. Or you yourself, sir, should be old as I am, if, like a crab, you could go backward. Though this be madness, yet there's method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave? Indeed, that is out of the air. <laughs> How 
pregnant, sometimes his replies are a happiness that often madness hits on which reason and sanity could not so prosperously be delivered of. I'll leave him and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. My honorable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. Except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Fare you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. You go to seek the Lord Hamlet? There he is. God save you, sir. My honored lord, my most dear lord, my excellent good friends. How dost thou, Guildenstern? Ah, Rosencrantz, good lads, how do ye both? As the indifferent children of the earth. Happy in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very buttons. Nor the soles of her shoes. <laughs> Neither, my lord. Then you live about her waist or in the middle of her faith. Faith, her privates, we. In the secret parts of fortune, oh, most true, she is a strumpet. <laughs> <laughs> What's the news? None, my lord, but that the world's grown honest. And then is doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question you more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. Oh, then is the world one? A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why, then, is none to you? For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Why, then, your ambition makes it one. It is too narrow for your mind. Oh, God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. Were it not that I have bad dreams? Which dreams, indeed, are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. A dream itself is but a shadow. <laughs> Truly. And I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. Then are our beggars' bodies and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggars' shadows. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we to the court, for by my fay I cannot reason. We'll wait upon you. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants, for to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord. No other occasion. Uh, beggar that I am, I'm even poor in thanks, but I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear. A half penny. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, deal justly with me. Come, come, they speak. Well, what should we say, my lord? Why, anything but to the purpose you were sent for. And there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to colour. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. <laughs> to what end, my lord? Well, that you must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the consonancy of our youth by the obligations of our ever-preserved life, and by what more dear a better proposer could charge you withal, be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. What say you? Nay, then, I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, <clears throat> we were sent for. I will tell you why. So. Shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen? Moat no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not. Lost all my mirth, foregone all custom of exercise. And indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame the earth seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy the air, look you. This brave, o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire. Why, it seems no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man? 
How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form, in moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. <laughs> no, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. Oh, my lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh then when I said man delights not me? To think, my lord, if you delight not in man, what lent and entertainment the players shall receive from you. Uh, we coded them on the way, and here are they coming to offer you service. <laughs> he that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. What players are they? Even those you were wont to take such delight in, the tragedians of the city. How chances did they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, were better both ways. Do they hold the same estimation they did when I was in the city? Are they so followed? No, indeed are they not. It is not very strange. For my uncle is king of Denmark, and those that would make mouths at him while my father lived give 20, 40, 50, 100 ducats apiece for his picture in little. Splunt, there is something in this more than natural, if philosophy could find it out. <laughs> there are the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come then, you are welcome. But my uncle father and aunt mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am at mad north-northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know hawk from a handsaw. Well be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Gilson, and you two at each ear here. Uh, that great baby you see there is not yet out of his swaddling clouts. <laughs> <laughs> Happily, he's the second time come to them, for they say an old man is twice a child. <laughs> I will prophesy, comes to tell me of the players, mark it. You say right, sir, a Monday morning for so indeed. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Roscius was an actor in Rome... The actors are come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon my honor. Then came each actor on his ass. The best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragic historical, tragical comical historical pastoral, scene indivisible or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. For the laws of writ and the liberty, these are the only men. O oh, Jephthah, judge of Israel. What a treasure hadst thou. What treasure had he, my lord? Why, one fair daughter, and no more, the which he loved passing well. Still on, my daughter? Am I not in the right, old Jephthah? If you call me Jephthah, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Nay, that follows not. What follows then, my lord? Why, as by lot, God what? And then you know it came to pass, as most like it was. But see, where my abridgment comes. You are welcome, masters, welcome all, welcome good friends. I'm glad to see thee well. Ah, my old friend. Why, thy face is valent since I saw thee last. Comes thou to beard me in Denmark? <laughs> what, my young lady and mistress? My lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last by the altitude of a shopine. Pray God your voice, like a piece of uncurrent gold, be not cracked within the ring. <laughs> Masters, you all welcome. We aim to it like French falconers, fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality, a passionate speech. What speech, my good lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted. Or if it was, not above once. For the play I remember pleased not the million. T'was caviar to the general. But it was, as I received it, an excellent play. Well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. One speech in it I chiefly loved. T'was Aeneas's tale to Dido. And thereabouts of it especially where he speaks of prime slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line. Now let me see. Let me see. The rugged Pyrrhus. Like the Hyrcanian beast, it is not so. It begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose doth the night resemble, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam, seeks. So proceed you. Poor God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good discretion. Anon he finds him striking too short at Greeks. His antic sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. 
unequal matched. Pyrrhus at prime drives, in rage strikes wide. But with the whiff and whine of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow, with flaming top stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear, for lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of Reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But as we often see against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold winds speechless, and the orb below as hush as death. And on the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So after Pyrrhus' pause, a roused vengeance at him knew a work, and never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars's armor forged for proof return with less remorse than Pyrrhus' bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune! This is too long. It shall to the barbers with your beard. Prithee, say on. He's for a jig or a tale of baudry, or he sleeps. Say on. Come to Hecuba. But who, oh, who had seen the moblet queen? The moblet queen. That's good. Moblet queen is good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with bison room. A clout upon that head where laid the diadem stood, and for a robe about her lank and all or timid loins a blanket, in the alarm of fear caught up, who this had seen, with tongue in venom steep against fortune's state would treason have pronounced. But if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamor that she made. Unless things mortal move them not at all, would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven. And passion in the gods. Look whether he has not changed his color and has tears in his eyes. Prithee, no more. Tis well. I'll have thee speak out the rest of this soon. Good, my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? Do you hear? Let them be well used, for they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. After your death, you would better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. My lord, I will use them according to their desert. God spotting his man much better. Use every man after his desert, and who should escape whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come. Sirs. Follow him, friends. We'll have a play tomorrow. Dost thou hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzago? I, my lord. We'll have it tomorrow night. You could, for a need, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines, which I would set down and insert it. Could you not? I, my lord. Very well. Follow that, lord. And look you, mock him not. My good friends, I leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Uh, good, my lord. I so God be with you. Now, I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice in his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull 
and muddy metal rascal peak like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward who calls me villain, breaks my paint across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie, the throat is deepest to the lungs, who does me this arm? The wounds, I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful, bloody, bawdy, villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindness, villain, Ass am I? This is most brave, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, and pack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab, a scullion, five on fall. About my brain, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before my uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tempt him to the quick if he but blench. I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. <laughs> the play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And can you by no drift of circumstance get from him why he puts on this confusion, grating so harshly all his days of quiet with turbulent and dangerous lunacy? He does confess he feels himself distracted. But from what cause, he will by no means speak. Nor do we find him forward to be sounded, but with a crafty madness, keeps aloof when we would bring him on to some confession of his true state. Did you essay him to any pastime? Madam, it so fell out that certain players ah. we all wrought on the way, of these we told him, and that it seemed in him a kind of joy to hear of it. They are about the court, and as I think they have already ordered this night to play before him. Tis most true, and he beseeched me to entreat your majesties to hear and see the matter. With all my heart. And it doth much content me to hear him so inclined. Good gentlemen, give him a further edge and drive his purpose on to these delights. We shall, my lord. Sweet Gertrude, leave us too, for we have closely sent for Hamlet hither, that he, as twere by accident, may hear affront Ophelia. Her father and myself, lawful espials, will so bestow ourselves that, seeing unseen, we may of their encounter frankly judge, and gather by him as he is behaved, if to be the affliction of his love or no that thus he suffers for. I shall obey you. And for your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wonted way again, to both your honors. Madam, I wish it may. Ophelia, walk you here. Gracious, so please you, we will bestow ourselves. Read on this book, the show of such an exercise may color your loneliness. I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. To be 
or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bear. Botkin, who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose bourn no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, Conscience doth make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pitch and moment, with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the fair Ophelia. Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Good, my lord. How does your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well. 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 My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed long to re-deliver. I pray you now receive them. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honored lord, you know right well you did. And with them words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. <laughs> Their perfume lost, take these again. For to the noble mind rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. Are you honest? My lord. Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? Aye, truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a board than the force of honesty can translate beauty to his own likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me, for virtue cannot so inoculate our own stock, but we shall relish of it. I love thee not. I was the more deceived. <laughs> Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest. But yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I'm very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offences at my back than I've thoughts to put them in imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? We have arrant names all, believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? At home. My lord. Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool Noah but in his own house. Farewell. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow. Thou shalt not escape calumny. 
Get thee to a nunnery, go and farewell. Or if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To a nunnery, go and quickly do farewell. Heavenly powers, restore him. I've heard of your paintings too well enough. God hath given you one face and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp, and you nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to, I'll no more, aunt. It hath made me mad. I say, we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one, shall live. The rest shall keep as they are to a nunnery. Go. Oh, what a noble mind is here o'erthrown. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Love, his affections do not that way tend. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul o'er which his melancholy sits on brood. And I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger. Which for to prevent, I have in quick determination thus set it down. He shall with speed to England for the demand of our neglected tribute. Haply the seas and countries different with variable objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart, whereon his brains still beating puts him thus from fashion of himself. What think you want? It shall do well. Yet do I believe the origin and commencement of his grief sprung from neglected love. How now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. Oh. My lord, do as you please. But if you hold it fit, after the play, let his queen mother, all alone, entreat him to show his grief. Let her be round with him, and I'll be placed, so please you, in the ear of all their conference. If she find him not, to England send him, or confine him where your wisdom best shall think. It shall be so. Madness in great ones must not unwatched go. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I would have such a fellow whipped, for all doing termagant, it out-herods Herod. <laughs> Pray you avoid it. I warrant, Your Honor. 
Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance that you all step not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is, to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censure of the which one must in your allowance or way a whole theatre of others. Oh, there be players that I've seen play and heard others praise and that highly, not to speak it profanely, that having neither the accent of Christian nor the gait of Christian, pagan or man, have so strutted and bellowed that I've thought some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. <laughs> I hope we have reformed that indifferently with us, sir. Oh, reform it altogether. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. For there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too. Though in the meantime, some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Go, make you ready. How now, my lord, will the king hear this piece of work? And the queen too, and that presently. Bid the players make haste. My lord. Will you two help to hasten them? We will, my lord. What oh, ho, Horatio. Yes, sweet lord, at your service. Horatio, our e'en as just a man as e'er my conversation cope with all. Oh, my dear lord. Nay, do not think I flatter. For what advancement may I hope from thee that no revenue has but thy good spirits to feed and clothe thee? Why should the poor be flattered? Dost thou hear? Since my dear soul was mistress of her choice and could of men distinguish, her election hath sealed thee for herself. For thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing. A man that fortunes, buffets, and rewards is tamed for equal thanks. And blessed are those whose blood and judgments are so well commingled that they are not a pipe for fortune's finger to sound what stop she please. Give me that man that is not passion's slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core. Yea, in my heart of heart, as I do thee. Something too much of this. There is a play tonight before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance which I've told thee of my father's death. I pray thee, when thou seest that act afoot, even with the very comment of thy soul, observe my uncle. If his occulted guilt do not itself unkennel in one speech, it is a damned ghost that we have seen. And my imaginations are as foul as Vulcan's stithy. Give him heedful note, for I, mine eyes, will rivet to his face and after we will both our judgments join in censure of his seeming. Well, my lord, if he steal off whilst this play is playing and escape detecting, I will pay the theft. They are coming to the play. I must be idle. Get you a place. How fares our cousin Hamlet? Excellent to faith of the chameleon's dish I eat the air. Promise crammed. You cannot feed capons so. <laughs> I have nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. No, nor mine now. My lord... You played once the university, you say? That did I, my lord, and was accounted a good act. And what did you enact? I did enact Julius Caesar. I was killed in the capital. Brutus killed me. <laughs> it was the brute part of him to kill so capital a calf there. <laughs> Be the players ready? Aye, my lord, they stay upon your patience. Come hither, my dear Hamlet, sit by me. No, good mother, here's metal more attractive. Oh, do you mark that? Lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean my head upon your lap. I, my lord. Did you think I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between a maid's legs. What is, my lord? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> you are merry, my lord. Who are? I, my lord. Oh, I. God, you're only jig maker. Why, what should a man do but be merry? For look you how cheerfully my mother looks. And my father died within two hours. Nay, 
Tis twice two months, my lord. So long? Nay, then let the devil wear black, for I'll have a suit of sables. Oh, heavens, die two months ago and not forgotten yet. And this hope a great man's memory may outlive his life half a year. But by a lady, he must build churches then. Mary, this is Mitching Malecho. It means mischief. Belight this show imports the argument of the play. We shall know by this fellow the players cannot keep counsel. They'll tell all. Will he tell us what this show meant? Aye, or any show that you show him. Be not you ashamed to show, he'll not shame to show you what it means. You are not. You are not. I'll mark the play. For us and for our tragedy, here stooping to your clemency, we beg your hearing patiently. Is this a prologue or the posy of a ring? It is brief, my lord. As woman's love. Full thirty times hath Phoebus' card gone around Neptune's salt wash and Tellus' orbit ground and thirty dozen moons with borrowed sheen about the world have times twelve thirties been since love our hearts and hymen did our hands Unite commutual in most sacred bands. So many journeys may the sun and moon make us again count all ere love be done. But woe is me, you are so sick of late, so far from cheer and from your former state that I distrust you. Yet though I distrust, discomfort you, my lord, it nothing must. Where love is great, the littlest doubts are feared. Where little fears grow great, great love grows there. Faith I must leave thee, love, and shortly too. My operant powers their functions leave to do. And thou shalt live in this fair world behind. Honored, beloved, and haply one as kind, for husband shalt thou... Oh, confound the rest! Such love must needs be treason in my breast. In second husband let me be accursed. None with the second, but who killed the first. <laughs> Wormwood. Wormwood. The instances that second marriage move are base respects of thrift, but none of love. A second time I kill my husband dead when second husband kisses me in bed. I do believe you think what now you speak. But what we do determine, oft we break. Purpose is but the slave to memory, of violent birth, but poor validity. What to ourselves in passion we propose, the passion ending doth the purpose lose. Our wills and fates do so contrary run that our devices still are overthrown. Our thoughts are ours, their ends none of our own. So think thou wilt no second husband wed, but die thy thoughts when thy first lord is dead. Nor earth to me give food, nor heaven light. Sport and repose lock for me day and night. To desperation turn my trust and hope, and anchors cheer in prison be my scope. Both here and hence pursue me lasting strife. If once a widow, Ever I be wife. If she should break it now. Tis deeply sworn. Sweet, leave me here a while. My spirits grow dull. And fain I would beguile the tedious day with sleep. Sleep, rock thy brain. And never come mischance between us twain. Madam, how like you this play? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. <laughs> <laughs> but she'll keep her word. Have you heard the argument? Is there no offence in it? No, they do but jest. Poison. In jest. No offence in the world. What do you call the play? The mousetrap. Mary how? Trappically. 
This play is the image of a murder done in Vienna. Gonzago, the Duke's name, his wife, Baptista. You shall see a non a Davish piece of work. But what of that? Your majesty and we that have free souls. It touches us not. Let the gold jade wince. Our withers are unwrung. This is one Lucianus, nephew to the king. You are as good as a chorus, my lord. I could interpret between you and your loves if I could see the puppets dallying. You are keen, my lord, you are keen. It would cost you a groaning to take off my edge. Begin, murderer pox, leave thy damnable faces and begin. Come, the croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Thoughts black hands apt drugs fit and time agreeing. Confederate season else no creature seeing. Thou mixed your rank of midnight weeds collected. With Hecate's band, thrice blasted, thrice infected, thy natural magic and dire property, unwholesome life, usurp immediately. He poisons him in the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. The story is extant and written in very choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. The king rises. What? Frighted with false fire? Oh, yes, my lord. Give o'er the play. Give me some light. Away. Fight. 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 Why let the spigot the ever weep? The hard and gold it play. But some must watch while some must sleep. Thus runs the world away. Oh, good Horatio. I take the ghost's word for a thousand pounds. It's perceived. Very well, my lord. Upon the talk of the poisoning. I did very well note him. Ah, come, some music. Ah. Come, the recorders. For if the king like not the comedy, why then belike he like it not, Perdi. Come, some music. Good, my lord, vouchsafe me a word with you. Sir, whole history. The king, sir. I sir, what of him? Is in his retirement marvellous distemper. With drink, sir? No, my lord, rather with colour. Your wisdom shall show itself more richer to signify this to the doctor. For for me to put him to purgation would perhaps plunge him into far more colour. Good, my lord, put your discourse into some frame and start not so wildly from my affair. I'm tame, sir. Pronounce. The queen, your mother... In most great affliction of spirit have sent me to you. <laughs> you are welcome. Nay, good my lord, this courtesy is not of the right breed. If it shall please you to make me a wholesome answer, I will do your mother's commandment. If not, your pardon, and my return shall be the end of my business. Sir, I cannot. What, my lord? Make you a wholesome answer, my wits disease. But, sir, such answers I can make, you shall command. Or rather, as you say, my mother. Therefore, no more but to the matter. My mother, you say? Then thus she says. Your behavior hath struck her into amazement and admiration. Oh, wonderful son that can so astonish a mother. But is there no sequel at the heels of this mother's admiration? In part, she desires to speak with you in her closet ere you go to bed. We shall obey, were she ten times our mother. Have you any further trade with us? Lord, you once did love me. And do still by these pickers and stealers. Good, my lord, what is your cause of distemper? You do surely bar the door upon your own liberty if you deny your griefs to your friend. Sir, I lack advancement. How can that be when you have the voice of the king himself for your succession in Denmark? Aye, sir, but while the grass grows, the proverb is something must be. Ah, the recorders. Let me see one. To withdraw with you, why do you go about to recover the wind of me as if you would drive me into a toil? Oh, my lord, if my duty be too bold, my love is too unmannerly. I do not well understand that. Will you play upon this pipe? My lord, I cannot. I pray you. Believe me, I cannot. I beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord. It is as easy as lying. Govern these vintages with your fingers and thumb. Give it breath with your mouth. And it will discourse most eloquent music. Look you, these are the stops. But these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. Why, look you now, how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there is much music, excellent voice in this little organ. Yet cannot you make it speak? Splat! Do you think I'm easier to be played on on the pipe? Call me what instrument you will. Though you can fret me, 
Yet you cannot play upon me. God bless you, sir. The Lord, the Queen would speak with you, and presently. <laughs> Do you see yon cloud that's almost in shape of a camel? By the mouse, and tis like a camel indeed. Methinks it's like a weasel. Tis bat like a weasel. Or like a whale. Very like a whale. Then I will come to my mother by and by. They fool me to the top of my bent. I will come by and by. I will say so. By and by is easily said. Leave me, friends. It is now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now might I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Soft. Now to my mother. O oh, heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrite, how in my words soever she be shent, to give them seals, never my soul consent. I like him not. No stands it safe with us to let his madness range. Therefore prepare you. I, your commission, will forthwith dispatch, and he to England shall along with you. The terms of our estate may not endure a hazard so near us as doth hourly grow out of his lunacies. We will ourselves provide, most holy and religious fear it is, to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. The cease of majesty dies not alone, but like a gulf doth draw what's near it with it. It is a massy wheel fixed on the summit of the highest mount, to whose huge spokes ten thousand lesser things are mortised and adjoined. Never alone did the king sigh, but with a general groan. Arm you, I pray you, to this speedy voyage, for we will fetters put about this fear which now goes too free-footed. We will haste us. The Lord, he's going to his mother's closet. Behind the arras, I'll convey myself to hear the process. I warrant she'll tax him home, and as you said, and wisely was it said, tis meet that some more audience than a mother, since nature makes them partial, should o'er hear the speech of vantage. Fare you well, my liege. I'll call upon you ere you go to bed, and tell you what I know. Thanks, dear my lord. Is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal, eldest curse upon it a brother's murder. <sighs> Pray, can I not? Though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. And like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Whereto serves mercy but to confront the visage of offense? And what's in prayer but this twofold force to be forestalled ere we come to fall? Or pardoned, being down? Then I look up. My fault is past. But oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder. 
That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, my own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offense? In the corrupted currents of this world, offense's gilded hand may shove by justice. And oft tis seen the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling. There the action lies in his true nature, and we ourselves compelled even to the teeth and forehead of our faults to give in evidence. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet, what can it when one cannot repent? Oh, wretched state. Oh, bosom black as death. Oh, limed soul that struggling to be free art more engaged. Help, angels. Make assay. Oh, bow, stubborn knees and heart with strings of steel. Be soft as sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. No, might I do it? Pat. Now he is praying. And now, do it. And so he goes to heaven. And so am I revenged? This would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven. Why? This is hire and salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly, full of bread, with all his crimes broad blown as flush as may. And how his audit stands, who knows, save heaven. But in our circumstance and course of thought is heavy with him. And am I then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? No. Absorbed. And know thou a more horrid hent, when he is drunk, asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at game, a swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it, then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell. Where to it goes? My mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. My words fly up. My thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts. Never. To heaven go. He will come straight. Look you, lay home to him, tell him his pranks have been too broad to bear with, and that your grace hath screened and stood between much heat in him. I'll sconce me even here. Pray you, be round with him. I'll warrant you, fear me not. Mother, mother, mother. Withdraw, I hear him coming.
Now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No, by the rude, not so. You are the queen, your husband's brother's wife. And would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then I'll set those to you that can speak. Come, now and sit you down. You shall not budge. You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help, help, help! Oh, no, help, help, oh, no. help, help, help. A rat. No. Dead for a good. No, no. Dead! Ah! Only oh, what hast thou done? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this. A bloody deed. Almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. As kill a king? Aye, lady. It was my word. Oh. Oh. Wretched, rash, intruding fool. Farewell. Oh. I took thee for thy better. <coughs> Take thy fortune. Thou finds to be too busy is some danger. <laughs> Leave wringing of your hands. Peace, sit you down. And let me wring your heart. For so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff, if damned custom have not grasped it so that it be proof and bulwark against sense. What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love and sets... A blister there makes marriage vows as false as dice as oaths. Oh, such a deed as from the body of contraction plucks the very soul and sweet religion makes a rhapsody of words. Heaven's face doth glow and this solidity and compound mass with tristful visages against the doom is thought sick at the act. And me what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index? Look here upon this picture. And on this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See what a grace was seated on this brow. Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, an eye like Mars to threaten and command, a station like the herald Mercury new lighted on a heaven-kissing hill, a combination and a form indeed where every god did seem to set his seal to give the world assurance of a man. This was your husband. Look you now, what follows. Here is your husband, like a mildewed ear blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor? Have you eyes? You cannot call it love, for at your age the heyday in the blood it's tame, it's humble and waits upon the judgment. And what judgment would step from this to this? Oh, shame, where is thy blush, rebellious hell, if thou canst mutine in a matron's bones, to flaming youth let virtue be as wax and melt in her own fire. Proclaim no shame when the compulsive ardor gives the charge, since frost itself as actively doth burn, and reason panders will. Oh, Hamlet, speak no more. Thou turnst mine eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their tint. Nay, but to live in the rank sweat of an inseamed bed, no. stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter in mine ears no more, sweet Hamlet. A murderer no. and a villain, a slave that is not twentieth part the tithe of your preceding lord, a vice of kings, a cut purse of the empire and the rule, that from the Shelf the precious diet in stone and put it in his pocket. No more! A king of shreds and patches! Save me. And hover o'er me with your wings, you heavenly guards. What would your gracious figure? Alas, he's mad. Do you not come, your tardy son, to chide that lapsed in time and passion lets go by the important acting of your dread command? Oh, say, do not forget this visitation is but to whet thy almost blunted purpose. 
But look, amazement on thy mother sits. Oh, step between her and her fighting soul. Conceit in weakest bodies, strongest works. Speak to her, Hamlet. How is it with you, lady? Alas, how is it with you? That you do bend your eye on vacancy and with the incorporal air do hold discourse. Forth at your eyes your spirits wildly peep. O oh, gentle sun, upon the heat and flame of thy distemper sprinkle cool patience. Whereon do you look? On him. On him. Look you how pale he glares. His form and cause conjoined preaching to stones would make them capable. Do not look upon me, lest with that piteous action you convert my stern effects, and what I have to do will want true color, tears perchance for blood. To whom do you speak this? Do you see nothing there? No, nothing at all, yet all it is I see. And do you nothing here? No, nothing but ourselves. Why, look you there. Look when it steals away. Oh. My father, oh. in his habit as he lived, <laughs> look where he goes, even now, out of the portal. This is the very coinage of your brain. This bodiless creation, ecstasy is very cunning in. Ecstasy. My pulse is yours, doth temperately keep time and makes us healthful music. It is not madness that I have uttered. Put me to the test. And I, the matter, will reword which madness would gamble from. <laughs> Mother, for love of grace, lay not that flattering unction to your soul that not your trespass but my madness speaks. It will but skin and film the ulcerous place, whilst rank corruption mining all within infects unseen. <laughs> Confess yourself to heaven. Repent what's past. Avoid what is to come. And do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them rancor. Oh, Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. <laughs> Throw away the worse part of it and live the pure with the other half. <laughs> Good night. But go not to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. Refrain tonight, and that will lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence, the next more easy. Once more. Good night. And when you are desirous to be blessed, I'll blessing beg of you. Oh. For the same Lord, I do repent. But heaven hath pleased it so to punish me with this and this with me that I must be their scourge and minister. I will bestow him and will answer well the death I gave him. So again, good night. I must be cruel, only to be kind. Thus bad begins, and worse remains behind. One word more, good lady. What shall I do? Not this by no means that I bid you do. Let the bloat king tempt you again to bed, pinch wanton on your cheek, call you his mouse, and let him for a pair of Vici kisses or paddling in your neck with his damned fingers make you to ravel all this matter out that I essentially am not in madness, but mad in craft. To a good you let him know. Be thou assured, if words be made of breath and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. I must do England, you know that. Alack, I had forgot to so conclude it on. There's letter sealed, and my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I would adders fanged, they bear the mandate. They must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Let it work. For it is the sport to have the engine a hoist with his own batar, and shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. Oh, it is most sweet when in one line two craft directly meet. This 
man shall set me packing. I lug the guts into the neighbor room. Mother, good night. Indeed, this counselor is now most still, most secret, and most grave, who was in life a foolish, prating <laughs> knave. Come, sir, to draw toward an end with you. Good night, mother. <laughs> <laughs> Where is your son? Oh, my, my own dear Lord, what I have seen tonight. <laughs> what, Gertrude? How does Hamlet? Mad as the sea and wind, when both contend which is the mightier, in his lawless fit, behind the arrows hearing something stir, whips out his rapier, cries, A rat, a rat, and in this brainish apprehension, Kills the unseen good old man. Oh, heavy deed. <laughs> it had been so with us had we been there. <laughs> Alas, how shall this bloody deed be answered? Where's he gone? To draw apart the body he had killed, or whom his very madness, like some ore among a mineral of metal's base, Shows itself pure. He weeps for what he's done. Oh, Gertrude, come away. The sun no sooner shall the mountains touch, but we will ship him hence. And this vile deed we must, with all our majesty and skill, both countenance and excuse. Ho, oh, Gildenstern! Friends both, go join you with some further aid. Hamlet... In madness hath Polonius slain, and from his mother's closet hath he dragged him. Go seek him out, speak fair, and bring the body into the chapel. I pray you, hasten this. Come, Gertrude. We'll call up our wisest friends and let them know both what we mean to do and what's untimely done. Oh, come away. My soul is full of discord and dismay. Safely stowed. Hamlet! Lord Hamlet! But soft, what noise? Who calls on Hamlet? <laughs> ah, here they come. What have you done, my lord, with the dead body? Compounded it with dust, where to tis kin. Tell us where tis that we may take it thence and bear it to the chapel. Sir, do not believe it. Believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own, besides to be demanded of a sponge. What replication should be made by the son of a king? Take you me for a sponge, my lord? Aye, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities. But such officers do the king best service in the end. He keeps them like an apple in the corner of his jaw, first mouthed to be last <clears throat> swallowed. When he needs what you have gleaned, it is but squeezing you and sponge. You shall be dry. I understand you not, my lord. I'm glad of it. A knavish speech sleeps in a foolish ear. My lord, you must tell us where the body is and go with us to the king. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing... A thing, my lord? Of no thing. <laughs> Bring me to him. Hi, folks, and all after. Lord Hamlet! Lord Hamlet! How dangerous is it that this man goes loose? Yet must not we put the strong law on him? He's loved of the distracted multitude who like not in their judgment but their eyes. To bear all smooth and even, this sudden sending him away must seem deliberate pause. Diseases desperate grown by desperate appliance are relieved, or not at all. How now, what hath befallen? With the dead bodies bestowed, my lord, we cannot get from him. But where is he? Without, my lord, guard it to know your pleasure. Bring him before us. Oh, Gildenstern, bring him, my lord! Now, Hamlet, 
Where's Polonius? At supper. At supper? Where? Not where he eats, but where he's eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are eaten at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable service. Two dishes but to one table. That's the end. Alas, alas. A man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king, and eat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. What dost thou mean by this? Nothing. But to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. Where is Polonius? In heaven. Send thither to sea. If your messenger find him not there, seek him at the other place yourself. But indeed, if you find him not within this month, you shall nose him as you go up the stairs into the lobby. Go seek him there. He will stay till you come. Hamlet, this deed, for thine especial safety, which we do tender as we dearly grieve for that which thou hast done, must send thee hence with fiery quickness. Therefore prepare thyself. The bark is ready and the wind at help. The associates tend, and everything is bent for England. England? Aye, Hamlet. Good. So is it if thou knewst our purposes. <laughs> I see a cherub that sees them. But come, for England. Farewell, dear mother. Thy loving father, Hamlet. My mother, father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh, and so... My mother. But come, for England. Follow him at foot. Tempt him with speed aboard. Delay it not, I'll have him hence tonight. Away, for everything is sealed and done that else leans on the affair. Pray you, make haste. And England, if my love thou holdst at aught, as my great power thereof may give thee sense, thou mayst not coldly set our sovereign process, which imports at full by letters congruing to that effect, the present death of Hamlet. Do it, England. For like the hectic in my blood he rages, and thou must cure me. Till I know it is done, howe'er my haps, my joys were ne'er begun. Go, Captain. From me, greet the Danish king. Tell him that by his license, Fortinbras craves the conveyance of a promised march over his kingdom. You know the rendezvous. If that his majesty would aught with us, we shall express our duty in his eye. And let him know so. I will do it, Lord. Go softly on. Good sir, whose powers are these? They are of Norway, sir. Our purpose, sir, I pray you? But against some part of Pope. Who commands them, sir? The nephew to all Norway, fought in Brass. Goes it against the main of Poland, sir, or for some frontier? Truly to speak, and with no addition, we go to gain a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name. To pay five ducats, five, I would not farm it. Why, then the Polak never will defend it. Yes, it is already garrison. 2,000 souls and 20,000 ducats will not debate the question of this straw. This is the imposthume of much wealth and peace that inward breaks and leaves no cause without why the man dies. I humbly thank you, sir. God be with you, sir. Will please you go, my lord? Yeah, I'll be with you straight. Go a little before. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. 
What is a man if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed? A beast no more. Sure he that made us with such large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. Now whether it be bestial oblivion, or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which quartered hath but one part wisdom, and ever three parts coward. I do not know why yet I live to say this thing's to do, since I've cause and will and strength and means to do it. Examples gross as earth exhort me, Witness this army of such mass and charge, led by a delicate and tender prince whose spirit with divine ambition puffed makes mouths at the invisible event, exposing what is mortal and unsure to all that fortune, death, and danger dare, even for an eggshell. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor's at the stake. How stand I, then, that have a father killed, a mother stained, excitements of my reason and my blood, and let all sleep, whilst to my shame I see the imminent death of twenty thousand men, that for a fantasy and trick of fame go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try the cause, which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody, or be nothing worth. I will not speak with her. She is importunate, indeed distract. Her mood will needs be pitied. What would she have? She speaks much of her father, says she has those tricks of the world, and hems and beats her heart spurns enviously at straws, speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense. For good she was spoken with, for she may strew dangerous conjectures in ill-breeding minds. Let her come in. To my sick soul, as sin's true nature is, each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. So full of artless jealousy is guilt, it spills itself in fearing to be spilt. Where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? Why, how now, Ophelia? How should I your true love know from another one? By his cockle hat and stuff and his sandal shone. Alas, sweet lady, what imports this song? Say you nay, pray you mark. He is dead and gone, lady, he is dead <laughs> and gone. At his head a grass-green turf, at his heels a stone. Nay, but Ophelia. Pray you, Mark. White his shroud as the mountains. Stone. Alas, look here, my lord. Lauded with sweet flowers. Which bewept to the grave did go with true love showers. How do you, pretty lady? Well, God yield you. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord, we know what we are, but we know not what we may be. <laughs> God be at your table. Conceit upon her father. Pray you, let's have no words of this. But when they ask you what it means, say you this. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, only in the morning be time. And I am made at your window to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes and up the chamber door. Let in a maid that out a maid never departed more. Pretty Ophelia. Indeed. La. Without an oath, I'll make an end on it. Ah! By gifts and by saint charity, a lack and fie for shame. Young men will do it if they come to it. By cock, they are to blame. 
For the shame before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. He answers, so would I have done by yonder sun, and thou hadst not come to my bed. How long hath she been thus? I hope all will be well. We must be patient. But I cannot choose but weep to think they should lay him in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it. And so I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. <laughs> good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Follow her close. Give a good watch, I pray you. Oh, this is the poison of deep grief. It springs all from her father's death. Oh, Gertrude, Gertrude, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. First, her father slain. Next, your son gone, and he most violent oath of his own just remove. The people muddied thick and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers for good Polonius' death. And we have done but greenly and hug a mugger to inter him. Poor Ophelia, divided from herself and her fair judgment. Last, and as much containing as all these, her brother is in secret come from France and wants not buzzers to infect his ear with pestilent speeches of his father's death. Alack, what noise is this? Where are my Switzers? Let them guard the door. My lord, my lord. What is the matter? Save yourself, my lord. The ocean, overpearing of his list, eats not the flats with more impetuous haste than young Laertes in a riotous head or bears your officers. The rabble call him lord. They cry, choose we, Laertes shall be king. Caps, heads, and tongues are thrown to the clouds. Laertes shall be king. Laertes, king. Come cheerfully on the false trail, they cry. This is counter, you false Danish dogs. The doors are broke. Where is this king? Sir, stand to war with us. Oh, oh, yes, oh, I pray oh, you give me leave. I thank you. Keep the door. Oh, oh, vile king. Give me my father. Calmly, good Laertes. That drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard. Cries cuckle to my father. Brands the harlot even here between the chaste, unsmirted brows of my true mother. What is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? Let him go, Gertrude. Do not fear our person. There's such divinity doth hedge a king that treason can but peep to what it would. Acts little of his will. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed? Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man. Where is my father? Dead. But not by him. Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. To hell allegiance. Vows to the blackest devil. Conscience and grace to the profoundest pit, I dare damnation. To this point I stand that both the worlds I give to negligence, let come what comes. Only I'll be revenged most truly for my father. Who shall stay you? My will, not all the world. And for my means I'll husband them so well they shall go far with little. Good Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your dear father's death, is writ in your revenge that swoopstake you will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser? None but his enemies. Will you know them then? To his good friends. Thus wide I'll open my arms and like the kind life-rendering pelican repast them with my blood. Why, now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman. That I am guiltless of your father's death and am most sensibly in grief for it, it shall as level to your judgment pierce as day does to your eye. Let her come in. Oh, now, what noise is that? Oh, he dry up my brains. Tears seven times salt burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. By heaven, thy madness shall be paid with weight till our scale turn the beam. Oh, Rose of May, dear maid, kind sister, sweet Ophelia. Oh, heavens, is it possible a young maid's wit should be as mortal as an old man's life? Day for him, fair face 
feast on a beer. Hey, na na ni, hey, na ni. And in his grave rained many a tear. <gasps> Fare you well, my dove. Hadst thou thy wits, and didst persuade revenge, it could not move us. You must sing down, down, and you call him a down. Oh, how the wheel becomes it. <gasps> it is the false steward that stole his master's daughter. This nothing's more than matter. There's rosemary. That's for remembrance. Pray you love, remember, and pansies, that's for thoughts. A document in madness, thoughts and remembrance fitted. There's fennel for you, and columbine. There's rue for you, and here's some for me. We may call it over grace of Sundays. Oh, you must wear your rue with a difference. There's a daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. For Bonnie, sweet Robin. Thought and affliction, passion, hell itself, she turns to favor and to prettiness. And will he not come again? And will he not come again? No. No, he is dead. Go to thy deathbed. He never will come again. His beard was as white as snow. All flaxen was his pole. He is gone. He is gone. And we... Cast away, moan. God, have mercy on his soul. And on all Christian souls, I pray, God. God be with you. You see this? Oh, God! Laertes, I must commune with your grief, or you deny me right. Oh, let this be so. His means of death, his obscure funeral. No trophy, sword, nor hatchman, nor his bones, no noble rites, nor formal ostentation. Cry to be heard, as it were from heaven to earth, that I must call it in question. So you shall. And where the offense is, let the great axe fall. Now must your conscience my acquittance seal, and you must put me in your heart for friend. Since you shall know that Hamlet who hath your noble father slain, pursued my life. And so have I, a noble father lost, a sister driven into desperate terms, whose worth, if praises may go back again, stood challenger on mount of all the age for her perfections. But my revenge will come. Break not your sleeps for that. You must not think that we are made of stuff so flat and dull that we can let our beard be shook with danger and think it pastime. You shortly shall hear more. How oh, now? What news? Letters, my lord, from Hamlet. This to your majesty and this to the queen. From Hamlet? Who brought them? Sailors, my lord, they say. I saw them not. Laertes, you shall hear them. Leave us. High and mighty. You shall know that I am set naked on your kingdom. Tomorrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes, when I shall, first asking your pardon thereunto, recount the occasion of my sudden and more strange return, Hamlet. What should this mean? Are all the rest come back? Or is it some abuse and no such thing? Know you the hand? Tis Hamlet's character. Naked. And in a postscript here he says, alone. Can you advise me? I'm lost in it, my lord, but let him come. It warms the very sickness in my heart that I shall live and tell him to his teeth. Thus didst thou. 
If it be so, Laertes, will you be ruled by me? Aye, my lord. So you will not or rule me to a peace. To thine own peace. If he be now returned, as checking at his voyage, and that he means no more to undertake it, I will work him to an exploit now ripe in my device, under the which he shall not choose but fall. And for his death, no wind of blame shall breathe, but even his mother shall uncharge the practice and call it accident. My lord, I will be ruled. The rather if you could devise it so that I might be the organ. It falls right. You have been talked of since your travel much, and that in Hamlet's hearing, for a quality wherein they say you shine. What part is that, my lord? Oh, a very ribboned in the cap of youth. Two months since, he was a gentleman of Normandy. He made confession of you and gave you such a masterly report for art and exercise in your defense and for your rapier most especial that he cried out, it would be a sight indeed if one could match you. Sir, this report of his did Hamlet so envenom with his envy that he could nothing do but wish and beg your sudden coming or to play with him. Now, out of this. What? Out of this, my lord? Laertes. Was your father dear to you? Or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Why ask you this? Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed more than in words? To cut his throat in the church. No place indeed should murder sanctuaries. Revenge should have no bounds. But, good Laertes, will you do this? Keep close within your chamber. Hamlet returns shall know you are come home. We'll put on those, shall praise your excellence, and set a double varnish on the fame the Frenchman gave you. Bring you in fine together, and wager on your heads. He, being remiss, most generous, and free from all contriving, will not peruse the foils, so that with ease, or with a little shuffling, you may choose a sword unbated, and in a pass of practice, requite him for your father. I will do it. And for that purpose, I'll anoint my sword. I bought an unction of a mountebank, so mortal, that but dip a knife in it where it draws blood. No cataplasm so rare, collected from all the simples that have a virtue under the moon, can save the thing from death that is but scratched withal. I'll touch my point with this contagion, that if I gall him slightly, it may be death. Hmm. Let's further think of this. If this should fail. Soft, let me see. I had. When in your motion you are hot and dry, as make your bouts more violent to that end, and that he calls for drink, I'll have prepared him a chalice for the nods, whereon but sipping, if he by chance escape your venom stuck, our purpose may hold there. My lord! My lord! How now, sweet queen? One more doth tread upon another's heels so fast they follow. Your sister's drowned, Laertes. Drowned? Where? There is a willow grows a slant a brook that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come, of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples, that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs, her coronet weeds clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke. When down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide, and murmured like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature native and endued unto that element. But long it could not be, till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Alas! And she is drowned? Drowned. Drowned. 
Too much of water hast thou, poor Ophelia, and therefore I forbid my tears. And yet it is our trick. Nature her custom holds, let shame say what it will. When these are gone, the woman will be out. Adieu, my lord. I have a speech of fire that fame would blaze, but that this folly does it. How much I had to do to calm his rage. Now fear I, this will give it start again. Therefore, let's follow, Gertrude. Is she to be buried in Christian burial that willfully seeks her own salvation? I tell thee she is, and therefore make her grave straight, for the crowner hath sat on her and finds it Christian burial. How can that be unless she drowned herself in her own defence? Oh, it is found so. It must be si offendendo. It cannot be else, for here lies the point. If I drown myself wittingly, it argues an act, and an act hath three branches. It is to act. To do, to perform, Argyll, she drowned herself wittingly. Nay, but hear you, good man, Delver. Give me leave. Here lies the water. Good. Here stands the man. Good. Oh, if the man go to this water and drown himself, it is willy-nilly. He goes. Mark you that. But if the water come to him and drown him, he drowns not himself. Argyll, he that is not guilty of his own death shortens not his own life. But is this law? I marryest Crowner's quest law. Will you have the truth, aunt? If this had not been a gentlewoman, she should have been buried out of Christian burial. Why, right there thou sayest, and the more pity that great folk should have countenance in this world to drown or hang themselves more than their even Christian. Come, my spade. There is no ancient gentleman but gardeners, ditchers, and grave makers. They hold up Adam's profession. Was he a gentleman? Or was the first that ever bore arms? Why, he had none. What art a heathen? How dost thou understand the scripture? The scripture says Adam digged. Could a dig without arms? I'll put another question to thee. If thou answerest me not to the purpose, confess thyself. Go to. What is he? that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter. Ah, ah the gallows maker, for that frame outlives a thousand tenants. I like my <laughs> wit well, in good faith, the gallows does well. But how does it well? It does well to them that do ill. Now thou dost ill to say the gallows is built stronger than a church. Argyll, the gallows may do well to thee. He <laughs> to it again, come. What is he that builds stronger than either a mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter? Oh, tell me that, an onion. Ah, uh, Mary, now I can tell. To it. Mass, I cannot tell. Cudgel thy brains no more about it, for your dull ass will not mend his pace with beating. And when you ask this question next, say a grave maker. Oh. The houses he makes last till doomsday. Go get thee to yawn, fetch me a stoop of liquor. In youth, when I did love, did love, methought it was very sweet to contract all the time for my behove. Oh, methought there was nothing meet. Has this fellow no feeling of his business that he sings at grave making? A well, custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. <laughs> Why does he so? The hand of little employment hath a daintier sense. But age with his stealing steps hath clawed me in his clutch and hath shipped me into the land as if I had never been such. <laughs> that skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. How the knave jowls it to the ground as if it were Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. This might be the pate of a politician which this ass now all reaches, one that would circumvent God, might it not? It might, my lord. Or of a courtier which could say, Good morrow, sweet lord, how dost thou, good lord? <laughs> this might be my lord such a one that praised my lord such a one's horse when he meant to beg it, might it not? Aye, my lord. Why, so. And now, my lady worms, chopless and knocked about the mazard with a sexton spade, here's fine revolution, and we had the trick to see it. 
Did these bones cost no more the breeding but to play at loggets with them? <laughs> Mine ache to pick on. A pickaxe and a spade, a spade for and a shrouding sheet. Oh, a pit of clay for to be made for such a guest is meat. <laughs> Whose grave's this, sir? Mine, sir. Oh, a pit of clay for to be made, for such a guest is me. I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest in. You lie out on, sir, therefore it is not yours. For my part, I do not lie in, yet it is mine. Thou dost lie in, to be in, and say it is thine. Tis for the dead, not the quick, therefore thou liest. Tis a quick lie, sir, twill away again from me to you. <laughs> <laughs> What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. What woman, then? For none, neither. Well, who is to be buried in? One that was a woman, but rest her soul, she's dead. We must speak by the card, or equivocation will undo us. <laughs> How long hast thou been a grave maker? Of all the days of the year, I came to it that very day that our last king, Hamlet, or came fought in brass. How long is that since? Why, cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was that day that young Hamlet was born. He that is mad and sent into England. Aye, Mary. Why was he sent into England? Why, because I was mad. I shall recover his wits there. Or if I do not, tis no great matter there. Why? T'will not be seen in him there. There the men are as mad as he. How came he mad? Very strangely, they say. How? Strangely. Faith in with losing his wits. Upon what ground? Why, here in Denmark. I've been sexton here, man and boy, thirty years. How long will a man lie the earth ere he rot? With faith, if I be not rotten afore I die, as we have many pocky courses nowadays that will scarce hold the laying in, I will last you some eight year or nine year. A tanner will last you nine year. Why he more than another? Why, sir, his hide is so tanned with his trade, it'll keep out water a great while. And your water is a sore decayer of your horse and dead body. Here's a skull now. This skull has lain in the earth three and twenty years. Whose was it? A horse and mad fellas it was. <laughs> Who's do you think it was? <laughs> yeah, I know not. A pestilence on him for a mad rogue. He, he poured a flag of the Rhenish on my head, but... <laughs> <laughs> This same skull, sir, was Yorick's skull. The king's jester. This? In that. Let me see. <laughs> Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. Ah. He hath borne me in his back a thousand times. And now, how abhorred in my imagination it is, my gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I've kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now? Your songs, your gambols, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar. Not one now to mock your own grinning, quite chop-fallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Prithee, Horatio, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked to this fashion in the earth? Mm. In so. <laughs> and smelt so? In so, my lord. <laughs> To what base uses we may return, Horatio? Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till he find it stopping a bunghole? It were to consider too curiously to consider so. No oh, faith, not a jot, as thus. Alexander died. Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth to dust. The dust is earth. Of earth we make loam. And why of that loam, whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? <laughs> <laughs> Imperious Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that that earth, which kept the world in awe, should patch a wall to expel 
the winter's floor. It's softer. It's softer, wife. Here come the king, the queen, the courtiers. Who is this they follow and with such maimed rites? This doth betoken the course they followed it with desperate hand, foredo its own life. It was of some estate. Couch we a while and mark. What ceremony else? That is Laertes, a very noble youth. Mark. What ceremony else? Our obsequies have been as far enlarged as we have warranty. Her death was doubtful. And with that great command or sways the order she should in ground unsanctified have lodged till the last trumpet. For charitable prayers, shards, flints, and pebbles should be thrown on her. Yet here she has allowed her virgin crans, her maiden strumments, and the bringing home of bell and burial. Must then no more be done? No more be done. We should profane the service of the dead to sing a requiem and such rest to her as to peace parted souls. Lay her in the earth, and from her fair and unpolluted flesh a violet spring. I tell thee, churlish priest, a ministering angel shall my sister be when thou liest howling. What? The fair Ophelia? Sweets to the sweet. Farewell. I hope thou shouldst have been my Hamnet's wife. I thought thy bride bed to have decked, sweet maid, and not have strewed thy grave. Oh, treble, woeful, ten times treble on that cursed head whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of. Hold off the earth a while till I have caught her once more in my arms. Yes, I yes, I pile your dust upon the quick and dead, till of this flat a mountain you have made to water up old Pelion, or the sky's head of blue Olympus. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis, whose phrase of sorrow can choose the wandering stars and makes them stand like wonder-wounded hearers? This is I, Hamlet, the day, oh, the I devil take it. thy soul! If thou place not well, I pray thee take thy fingers from my throat, for though I am not splendid and rash, yet have I in me something dangerous which let thy wisdom fear. Hold off your hand. Pluck them asunder. Hamlet, Hamlet! Good my lord, be quiet! Why, I will fight with him upon this theme until my eyelids will no longer wear. Oh, my son, what theme? I loved Ophelia. Forty thousand brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum. What will thou do for her? He is mad, Laertes. Oh, God forbid! Yes, Moon, show me what thou do, would weep, would fight, would fast, would tear thyself, would drink up Isle, eat a crocodile, I'll do it, this come here a wine, do I face me with leaping in her grave? Be buried quick with her, and so will I, and if thou pray to mountains, let them throw millions of acres on us, till our ground singeing his pate against the burning zone, make osser like a wart. Nay, and out mouth. I'll rant as well as thou. This is mere madness, and thus a while the fit will work on him, and on as patient as the female dove when that her golden couplets are disclosed, his silence will sit drooping. Sir, what is the reason that you use me thus? I loved you ever, but tis no matter. Let Hercules himself do what he may, the cat will mew, and dog will have his day. I pray thee, good Horatio, wait upon him. Strengthen your patience in our last night's speech. We'll put the matter to the present push. Good Gertrude, set some watch over your son. This grave shall have a living monument. An hour of quiet shortly shall we see. Till then, in patience, our proceeding be. Rashly, and praise be rashness for it, let us know our indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our deep plots to Paul. That would learn us, there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. Oh, that is most certain. So Guildenstern and Rosencrantz go to it. Why, man, they did make love to this employment. They are not near my conscience. 
is dangerous when the baser nature comes between the pass and fell incensed points of mighty opposites. Why, what a king is this? Does it not think thee stand me now upon he that hath killed my king and whored my mother, popped in between the election and my hopes, thrown out his angle for my proper life, and with such cousinage? Is not perfect conscience to quit him with his arm, and is not to be damned to let this canker of our nature come in further evil? It must be shortly known to him from England. What is the issue of the business there? It will be short. The interim is mine, and a man's life no more than to say, one. But I am very sorry, good Horatio, that too late I forgot myself. For by the image of my cause, I see the portraiture of his. I would caught his favours, but sure the bravery of his grief did put me into a towering passion. Peace. Who comes here? Your lordship is right welcome back to Denmark. I humbly thank you, sir. Does know this waterfly? <laughs> no, my good lord. My state is the more gracious for his advice to know him. Sweet lord, if your lordship were at leisure, I should impart a thing to you from his majesty. I will receive it, sir, with all diligence of spirit. Uh, put your bonnet to his right use. Tis for the head. I thank your lordship. It is very hot. Nay, believe me, it is very cold. The wind is northerly. It is indifferent cold, my lord, indeed. And yet methinks it's very sultry and hot for my complexion. Exceedingly, my lord, it is very sultry, as to where I cannot tell how. But, my lord, his majesty has bade me signify to you that he has laid a great wager on your head. Sir, here is the matter. I beseech you, remember. Nay, good my lord, for mine ease in good faith. <laughs> Sir, here is newly come to court Laertes, believe me, an absolute gentleman, full of most excellent differences, of very soft society, and great showing. What imports the nomination of this gentleman? Of uh, Laertes? Of him, sir. You are not ignorant of what excellence Laertes is. I mean, sir, for his weapon. What's his weapon? Rapier and dagger. That's two of his weapons. <laughs> but, well... The king, sir, has laid, sir, that in a dozen passes between yourself and him, he shall not exceed you three hits. He has laid on twelve for nine, and it shall come to immediate trial if your lordship would vouchsafe the answer. How if I answer no? I mean, my lord, the opposition of your person in trial. Sir, I will walk here in the hall. If it please his majesty, it is the breathing time of day with me. Let the foils be brought, the gentleman willing, the king hold to his purpose. I will win for him, and if I can. If not, I shall gain nothing but my shame and the odd hits. Shall I re-deliver you e'en so? To this effect, after what flourish your nature will. <laughs> I commend my duty to your lordship. Yours. Yours. He does well to commend it himself. There are no tongues else for stern. You will lose this witcher, my lord. I do not think so. Since he went into France, I've been in continual practice. I shall win at the odds. But thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart. Nay. It is no matter. Nay, good it is my but lord. foolery. It's such a kind of gain giving as might perhaps trouble a woman. If your mind is like anything, obey it. I will forestall the repair hither and say you are not fit. Not a whit. We defy augury. There is special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man hath aught of what he leaves, what is to leave betimes? Let be. <laughs> Come, Hamlet. Come and take this hand from me. Give me your pardon, sir. I've done you wrong. But pardon it as you are a gentleman. This presence knows, and you must needs have learned how I am punished with a sore distraction. Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I have shot my arrow all the house and hurt my brother. 
I am satisfied in nature, whose motive in this case should stir me most to my revenge. But in my terms of honor, I stand aloof and will no reconcilement. Till by some elder masters of known honor, I have a voice and precedent of peace to keep my name on gold. But till that time, I do receive your offered love like love, and will not wrong it. I embrace it freely, and will this brother's wager frankly play? Give us the foils, come on. Come, one for me. I'll be all foil, ladies. In my ignorance, your skill shall like a star of the darkest night stick fiery off indeed. You mock me, sir? No, by this hand. Give them the foils, young Osric. Cousin Hamlet, you know the wager? Very well, my lord. Your grace has made the odds of the weaker side. I do not fear it. I have seen you both. But since he is bettered, we have the odds. This is too heavy. Let me see another. It's like to be well. These foils of all a length? Aye, my good lord. Set me the stoops of wine upon that table. If Hamlet give the first or second hit, or quit in answer the third exchange, the king shall drink to Hamlet's bitter breath. And in the cup, an union shall he throw, richer than that which four successive kings in Denmark's crown have worn. Come, begin. And you, the judges, bear a wary eye. Come, sir. Come, my lord. What? No. Judgment. A hit. A very palpable hit. Well, again. Stay. <laughs> Give me drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Give him the cup. Here's to thy help. I'll play this part first. Set it by a while. Come, sir. A touch, a touch, I do confess. <laughs> Our son shall win. He's faint and scant of breath. Here, Hamlet, take my napkin, rub thy brows. The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet. Good, madam. Gertrude, do not drink. I will, my lord, I pray you pardon me. It is the poisoned cup. It is too late. Come, let me wipe thy face. My lord, I'll hit him now. Do not think it. And yet it is almost against my conscience. Come for the third, ladies. You do but dally. I pray you pass with your best violence. I'm afraid you make a wanton of me. Say you so? Come on. Nothing. Neither way. How about you now? They are incensed! Hey, come again! Oh. Look to the queen there, hold! Oh, they bleed on both sides! How is my lord? Oh, how is Laertes? Where is a woodcock of mine own friend, Joffrey? I'm justly killed with mine own treachery. Oh. But of the queen, she swoons to see them bleed. No, no, the, the drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet, the drinker. I'm poisoned. Oh, villainy. All of the door be locked. Treachery, seek it out. It is here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. No! No medicine in the world can do thee good. Indeed, there is not half an hour of life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed. The foul practice had turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poisoned. I can no more. The king... The king's to blame. The point. Then venom too. Then venom to thy work. Oh, oh you defend me, please! I am but hurt! Damn thou incestuous adulterous. Damn me, death. Is thy union here? Drink off this potion. Follow my mother. He is justly served. It is a potion tended by himself. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not on thee, nor thine on me. Heaven make thee free of it. I follow thee. I'm dead, Horatio. I... Wretched queen, adieu. You that look pale and tremble at this chance, that I but mute saw audience to this act, had I but time as this fell sergeant death is strict in his arrest, 
Oh, I could tell you. But let it be. Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest. Report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. Never believe it. I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. There's yet some liquor left. I've got a man. Give me the cup. Let go by heaven. I have it. Oh. Good Horatio, what a wounded name thing standing thus unknown shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. What warlike noise is this? Young Fortinbras, with conquest come from Poland to the ambassadors of England, gives this warlike volley. <sighs> I die, Horatio. The potent poison quite all crows my spirit. I cannot live to hear the news from England, but I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice. So tell him with the occurrence more and less which have solicited. <laughs> the rest is silent. No cracks, a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince. And flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Why does the drum come hither? Where is the sight? What is it you would see? If aught of woe or wonder, cease your search. This quarry cries on havoc. Oh. Proud death, what feast is taught in thine eternal cell that thou so many princes at a shot so bloodily hast struck? Give order that these bodies high on the stage be placed to the view. And let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about. Let us haste to hear it and call the noblest to the audience. For me, with sorrow, I embrace my fortune. I have some rights of memory in this kingdom, which now to claim my vantage doth invite me. Let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, for he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royally. And for his passage, the soldier's music and the rights of war speak loudly for him. Take up the bodies. Such a sight as this becomes the field, but here shows much amiss. Go! Bid the soldiers shoot! Shoot! <laughs> 